When we set out to work on our next-gen game for the PlayStation 3, we really wanted to do something special, something that was completely different that nobody's ever seen before. You know, we looked at what was out there, the landscape of games that were being developed, and everything sort of had this dark and gray or brown look to it. So we wanted to go completely opposite of that, and we wanted to have a game that when somebody just caught it out of the corner of their eye walking past it in the store, they'd be drawn to it right away and just have to check it out and see what's this game all about. I think one of the, uh, the key of Uncharted that's gonna really stand out is the fact that everything looks uh, real and the player is gonna be uh, immersed completely into that game because you, like, you can believe that you are in that jungle. You're gonna see plants moving, you're gonna see real-time lights like uh, the sun and the refraction for the world, like all these things, all these details that you see every day. We were able to produce all of that. When we set off to make a brand new franchise, what we wanted to do was sort of embrace the, the action-adventure genre in its sort of classic form, but in a contemporary context. So we looked at a load of those matinee serials from the 30s, lots of chases, running around looking for treasure, unlikely allegiances with a whole crazy cast of characters, lots of narrow escapes and risky situations. So we took all of this stuff and then started to look at how we might be able to reinvent it for the 21st century. With the look of Uncharted, we wanted it to stand out from all the other games that are being developed of the next generation consoles. We wanted it to have this lush, organic feel. We didn't want to have the same gritty and dark corridors that so many of these games have you running around shooting aliens and, and fighting monsters in. We wanted you to be in this lush, tropical jungle that really immersed you and made you feel like you could feel the moisture in the air. It's a stylized reality and there's a little bit of vividness in the colors that we're choosing and everything's got this sort of larger than life quality. Naughty Dog has a legacy to try and put its mark in the art world and in games. So shapes and color both have a lot to do with the readability of an environment leading the player into an environment and how you're supposed to feel inside of that environment. So with the power of the PlayStation 3, we really felt like we could create environments that were believable and authentic. So we did a lot of research and tons and tons of photo reference, but we also tried to put a twist on it and give it our own style. So our concept artists would take these photos and embellish them and really set the direction for the overall look of Uncharted. We invested a lot of time in our rendering engine to make sure that the differences in texture between a, a glossy palm frond and the rough surface of some stone would really be a good, clear read for the player and just lend all of this believability to the environment. We always try to have some things that in a game that never been done before. Water was one of them and we are really happy because it adds a lot to the realism of our jungle. Whether it's ocean, whether it's a river, a stream, a puddle, a waterfall, we really wanted to make sure that you know water was everywhere and that we were going to try to display it in a way that it was never possible before in a previous generation of hardware. So we wanted the story in Uncharted to have historical relevance. So we decided to focus on a historical figure that you know, everybody knew from their fourth grade social study class, you know, Sir Francis Drake. He was out there basically robbing the ships that were coming back to Spain with all this gold from the New World. And we wanted to explore the areas that were kind of foggy in the history books where, you know, maybe not all the details were clear. And then what we did is we ran with it and explored the what if. What if Sir Francis Drake did have children? So our hero, Nathan Drake, believes himself to be a descendant of Sir Francis Drake. And there's treasure out there all over the place. And it's Nathan's job to go find it. So the gameplay in Uncharted is unique. We really wanted to bring together elements that were in other games, but combine them in a way that you've never seen in a single game before. So we, we have three pillars of gameplay. We have our traversal or platforming mechanics that you know, we, we've explored uh, heavily in our past games in Crash Bandicoot and Jack and Daxter. But we wanted to combine that with some really fast action over the top gunplay and then mix it in with the hand-to-hand -hand melee combat as well. A combination of mechanics and interactions that you, know, you really haven't seen put together in the same way ever before. My main focus on making Uncharted was gameplay, was how does the game feel? How does the game interact with the player? How does the world interact with the player? How enjoyable is the game? What's the fun factor on the game? And if it isn't fun, we try again. We come up with something new and 
and, and do it again. We iterated hundreds of times on almost every major mechanic in the game. Our first several attempts at Drake looked fantastic, just like the, the, the final product, but they didn't feel good. It has to feel like a Naughty Dog game. It has to be on a dime responsive. It requires just a lot of back and forth between a programmer and an animator. Making games is not a science, and we don't have a magic formula. We just put in the hard work to make something good, and we just keep trying things until we find something that works. <laughs> We drew a lot of our uh, inspiration for our characters from the classic pulp action adventure stories that you've seen uh, in books and movies and comics. One of the hallmarks of this genre is the fact that you have a very relatable hero who's kind of an everyman. All of the heroes are really recognizable human beings with all of our strengths and flaws. And we figured out that that was something very important for helping audiences connect with the character. This is finally it. It's not just the fact that you have chases and gunfights and a heroine and all this other kind of stuff. It's, it's the fact that the characters are real people. They can make mistakes, but be heroic. Nathan Drake is our hero, and he's the kind of guy who knows how to handle himself in a tight situation. But he's really just a guy in a t-shirt who finds himself in a difficult situation and has to rely on his wits a lot to save the day. Elena's a really cool character. I think she's something a little bit new and different for video games. She's a bright, self-sufficient young woman. She's very curious. She has this strong intellectual drive, has a kind of unconventional beauty. And there's this immediate chemistry between her and Nathan that really helps drive the story forward. What's going on? Boat. Pirates. Then there's the character of Victor Sullivan. He's kind of that guy's guy adventurer. He's the consummate con man in a world of con men. There's nothing here, Nate. Let's just keep that between us. For the first time in Uncharted, we actually had to cast actors who had stage or TV or film experience because we were doing motion capture for all of our cinematic cutscenes. So we have real stage and film actors coming in, getting in the motion capture suit, recording their voice while they're acting out the scene, which I think is really important because you, you capture that moment rather than having them try to pantomime to some voice dialogue they've already recorded. The physicality that's demanded in doing motion capture and creating, you know, an action film, essentially, has been tricky. All the stunt work we have to do here, I mean, I go, is this my job? This is so much fun. But at the same time, the next day, I'm like, oh my word, I am so incredibly sore. Well, I think the coming together of film, stage, and video and games is happening right here on the mocap stage. I really staged things as if I was doing a play or a scene from a movie. I had no experience. I was flying by the seat of my pants the whole time, scared to death and having a great time. You know, in front of a camera for, for film or for TV, you've got a set and the other actors that are there with you are in their costumes. Here, you're all, you all look very silly. You look like you're wearing a wetsuit with dots on it. And so it, it really requires you to exercise your imagination even more. It's like the three of us have this treehouse that we built and we're doing missions and it really makes you feel like you're on an adventure. I have a seven-year-old little boy who asked me, Dad, what do you do? And I said, well, you remember when your buddy came over the other day and you guys ran around the backyard and the clubhouse became a pirate ship and you were jumping off? And he said, yeah. I said, that's what I do. The hell? This is not a period historical adventure, it's a contemporary adventure. And so if we went with completely a classic approach to the music, kind of big orchestra, 
big traditional instruments used in traditional ways, to me that would have felt out of sync. Working in the action-adventure genre musically, you can frequently find yourself falling into a lot of cliché sort of action-adventure things musically. So we've tried really hard throughout the project to do things that people have never heard before. So the composer that we sought out actually is a guy named Greg Edmondson. Really great guy, really talented, and he's the guy that did all of the music for the television series Firefly. The way he was able to take unexpected instruments and use them to sort of support the story and this adventure, I thought, well, here's a guy I think who could get what we're after. Because you were on this work and you were searching for something primitive, they thought this would be fun to use unusual instruments that don't get used a lot and to use things that we do here, but not to use them in a normal way. And that sounded really intriguing to me. I like that kind of stuff. You can get all sorts of strange, unusual, weird ethnic instruments and play them in any number of ways. And it's just fun to do. He left a lot of room in the music and he infused a lot of rhythmic excitement into the music so that it's both engaging melodically and texturally, but it's also very malleable for us in post. We can shape it to the world and let the world breathe and let the sounds of the jungle come through. One of the things we try to do with each game we create at Nidog is make it a technical showcase for the PlayStation hardware. So we've got a team of the best engineers in the industry working on this game, and I think we are really going to set the bar for PlayStation 3. We wanted this game to be fun with a ton of different interactions, a ton of different mechanics. But at the same time, we wanted a really good story to have a, Drake be a real guy, a character, somebody that I can play, that I can interact with. That was the goal, and, and that's what we accomplished. We've created a contemporary action adventure set in the real world. It's not a fantasy game. It's very much rooted in the reality that we all know. And yet we really recapture all the romanticism in the original sense of telling a tale of heroic actions. So all of this stuff is really coming together to lend an incredible reality to our player character that I think audiences have really connected to. I think there's a huge value in going outside your comfort zone. You just don't go right to the obvious. Now, it makes everything much harder, but in the end, it's all worth it. Get something that people haven't seen before. I'll be damned. I'm most excited about how fun it is to play and how you just lose yourself in the environment and the world that we've created. You know, I mean, when you pick up that controller, it's really easy to have fun, to be powerful, and feel like you are the action hero. Bonjour, bienvenue à Naughty Dog. Allô, salut. Welcome to Naughty Dog. Shalom. Konnichiwa. Hola, bienvenidos à Naughty Dog. Salam. Bonjour, bienvenue à Naughty Dog. C'est ici, je me robe. C'est ici, c'est ce que nous faisons. Hard of you. Enjoy the car, mas. Voici ce qu'on fait ici. Et nous aimons chanter nos simples. Allez, allez, nous allons faire ce qu'on fait ici. Allez, allez, nous Our philosophy at Night Dog is to make the best games possible and then for our own personal satisfaction, make sure that we have fun while we're doing it. We uh, are very ambitious in a good way, the way that we want to make uh, the, the games that are going to show off uh, our passion and our talent. The basic philosophy is pretty much just to invest every bit of yourself into, uh, into the products we make. We uh, have a group of very talented people. I think we probably have the best people in the industry. Lots of uh, freedom, lots of responsibilities. A lot of tape, duct tape. It's a lot of fun. I mean, I get paid to make video games. Elmer's glue is pretty good. The guys have really fought to keep that sort of garage developer mentality. Blood, sweat, tears. A lot of heart. Gonzo kick-ass game making. It's organized chaos. It amazes me every single time I see it. Since uh, Night Dog's inception, we've always wanted to have that Night Dog signature. So everything we do, we uh, bring that artistic flair to it. Attention to detail and to the story. A wish to make the absolute best experience for the player. We count on each other to push each other further um, than we thought we could go. Whatever an individual cannot solve alone, we can always come up with something together. The artists contribute to the game design, the game designers are, you know, 
working on the art direction, the look? We argue a lot and we fight all the time and because a lot of this stuff is subjective and but I think at the end of the day is all that argument is really putting all the ideas on the table and the best idea rises to the top. What we're driven by is like making the best game possible. A piece of art that we want to be proud of. A game that we'd want to play. It's not ego or anything like that. It's just all about the game. That's the key of the success. I'm trying to get the damn game to work. I'm in deep shit. Can I see my family now? Naughty Dog actually started off back in the 80s when uh, Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin called the company Jam Software for Jason and Andy Magic. Well, we got on the big stage back in 1996 with the release of Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation 1. And then when we moved on to PlayStation 2, we developed the Jack and Daxter franchise. And uh, now here we are on the PlayStation 3 launching our brand new franchise. So I'm charted Drake's fortune. We've grown to you know almost 90 people now, so the company's getting um, pretty large. But we're really trying to maintain that smaller company feel and uh, just just keep things fun and, and, and uh, relaxed around the office. For me, Naughty Dog is my second family. You guys, here, family, you know, close. We do a lot of long hours, but we have fun. Casual Friday all the time. <laughs> the humor is really open. It's uh, it's a great work environment. We have yoga classes. It's very colorful. Yeah. It's good for that you find the resource to and the strength to, to work here. We have foosball, right? Reigning champion. And then we have ping pong. And they're just a bunch of kids. Uh, dodgeball. One time we went on a bit of a racking trip. Very often we'll just play uh, the game ourselves and uh, try to beat each other. I'm not so much of a game player. The last demo we had, five minutes and 37 seconds. Programmers know that they really have to foster a good relationship with the artist. I think the best one was the uh, paintball game. It uh, takes a team effort. Shooting people with paintballs is just fun in general, especially when you're co-workers. Uh, get a ticket. Call the call center. That's all I can do. There's two French people in the company. There's me and there's Pogo. She's uh, a French bulldog. Pogo's a bitch. <laughs> She's probably the most important French uh, person in the company. She's the little princess. She's our dog here and the naughty dog. Little beast. It's always been a tradition to have a uh, dog mascot. When Evan walks around with her, it's like Dr. Evil and his cat. She's my French bulldog. Coming in the morning, right? She's naughty. Uh, sometimes you can smell it. Uh, you see what I mean? Sitting on getting ready to work. She's always looking for food. Digging through trash cans. Pogo is awesome, especially when she's in my trash can and spill everything on the floor. Nowhere else in the game industry, like company's president is walking around cleaning up the dog. One of the greatest feelings you can ever have in the game industry is shipping a game. When it finally goes gold master and you know that uh, all that effort is paid off. For a long time you think, is this really a game? Do we have a game? And then this moment comes along and you play it one day and all of a sudden you realize, hey, this is actually a video game and it's fun. For me is when I see that people can really create and walk and they have everything they need to do what they really want to do for the game. I have young nephews that always look forward to playing my games and it's, it's always something special to see them playing around Christmas and see their face light up and you get to actually have a hand in making something that creative and that wonderful to play. Direction, it's really always been a big thing for us at Naughty Dog. Um, with Uncharted, it wasn't any different. We really wanted to set the tone artistically and go with believable humans and take on this big challenge. But we wanted them to have a certain style to them. This is finally it. A lot of that involved really painting textures. All our textures are hand painted. We don't use any photos for our textures. That was a big part of it. We also knew that Uncharted was going to be a very, very heavily story driven game. And so we had these characters that needed to act. And I just might let you live. So the PS2 versus the PS3 was a really big jump for us. When we were working on the PS2, we were able to have two to three textures per character. For Uncharted, we're looking at anywhere between 20 to 30 textures per character, which is a huge jump for us. In terms of the models of the characters, we were able to go up to high detail, 30 million polygon characters, which is then converted into texture maps. But that was unheard of during the PS2 times. On the PS3, however, we have the power now to really take on human characters and make them believable. This is something that, you know, was an incredibly overwhelming task, but we really took on head first. The PS3 was able to allow us to create subtleties that we wouldn't be able to do previously. Skin detail, pore detail, um, have you know anatomically correct body structures, elaborate facial expressions. These are all things that the power of the PS3 has really allowed us to actually create.
For our modeling pipeline, we have a certain mesh that is a clean mesh that we take in to a program like ZBrush. We then sculpt the geometry and create these high detailed sculptures, uh, the kind of sculpture with wrinkles and poor detail. And from that, we take that information, we create a new re-optimized mesh, which is what actually ends up in the game. The purpose for that really allows us to define strong silhouettes. When you look at the character in the game, it has a very strong silhouette to it. To achieve cinematic quality, we looked at a lot of foams and the kind of things they were doing. One of the things in foam that we weren't able to do on the PS2, that we're able to do on the PS3 now, is they have complex shaders and complex rendering techniques. That allows us to create multiple layers of textures that we can pipe into a shader that gives us complex skin. We also looked at a lot of rendering techniques that take place in foam, post-blur effects, uh, specific lighting per character, soft shadows, all of these things is what really brings cinematic quality characters to life and we try to emulate those things in game. In order to create these characters, we knew as well that we were going to need an extensive amount of facial poses. Initially before on Jack Games we had somewhere between 60 and 80 poses. We figured for Uncharted we were going to need anywhere between 200 to 300 poses per character. There's so many small things inside of a character that really brings them to life. If one of those things is not working or is wrong, it breaks everything. So we had to really make sure that every aspect of the character was at the highest possible fidelity to keep them alive. Initially, we focused a lot on the mouth, making sure that the mouth could hit the correct accents when someone was talking. But soon we, we brought people in, people were looking at it, and everybody focuses on the eyes. That's a natural human thing to look people in the eyes when you talk to them. So we realized we really had to put a lot of attention into the eyes. This involved creating movement of the eyelids when the eyeball moved around. We would change the shape of the eyelids. We also added in self-shadowing where the eyeball meets the eyelid. That area was often very bright and glowed. So we created a custom shader that allowed us to actually darken and self-shadow the area inside of the eye. Not only was the face an important aspect of the character of us, but even his body and the way he moved. We also spent a lot of time developing systems that allowed us to emulate muscle structure inside of the body. So when the character actually flexes his arm, there's a bicep bulge. When he moves around, his chest actually has volume and form to it. So we created underlying joint structures that actually emulated muscles. And now when Drake moves around, he has a solid mass, a solid form, and he really feels like a believable character that's there and it's tangible. the character in the game. Here at Naughty Dog, animation has always been really important to us and has been heavily focused on. And so we knew we wanted to raise the bar of what we're doing and what the industry has been doing as a whole. And one of those things is to really uh, allow the, the character in the game to show emotion. And so you'll really be able to see that he's showing fear, that he's intimidated, that he's confident, or that he's insecure, that he's determined. And so all of that will come out and just really add a lot more life that wasn't there before in any game. We had three main goals uh, animating this character on this project. One of them was to achieve realistic movement with uh, a really good sense of weight. And the other is fluidity. We wanted him to smoothly go from, from move to move without popping from state to state, the way we see in a lot of other games. Um, and you put those two first goals together, and you get really fluid animation. It looks really good, but it's really slow and unresponsive. So the third goal, and the most important goal, is to get responsiveness. One of the things that makes Drake so lifelike is the sheer volume of animations that we're doing on this game. We're doing about 10 times more than we've ever done in the past, which is huge. I mean, it's a huge step, 10 times the amount of animation. With the variety that we're adding, the layers that we're adding on top, to try to mask all that so you don't see the same thing, and you see a lot of organic nature of the character, and that really gives it this humanness. What makes this game truly next-gen has been the focus that we're doing on movement. Uh, in the next generation, we've seen a lot of uh, great rendering, great shading, polygon counts are up higher, lighting's looking really good. So we've seen a lot of good looking games from a rendering perspective, and they all look really good from a still frame, but once you start to see them move, that's when they start to break down. The animation quality hasn't risen to that same level at this point. What we've found is that it's Drake's imperfections 
that make him believable. It's him stumbling. It's him not perfectly landing uh, correctly every time. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with him is make him a kind of an everyman put into an extraordinary situation. And we hope that comes across, uh, that he uh, doesn't do everything perfectly every time. PlayStation 3 really opened up the floodgates for us to uh, achieve the goals that we wanted to with the animation. We need much more CPU power than we've ever had before. Uh, and the amount of memory that we have to work with now just really allows us to have the quantity and, and quality that we need, uh, especially with the layers that we're doing and all the processes that, that are going on right now. Uh, it just could not be done in any other way. And if we can do that, then we can tell more of the story during gameplay uh, while he's in the middle of action and while the player is actually going through the levels and going through the game. In the past, the line between cinematics and gameplay has been very clear. Uh, you play the game, and then you go into a storytelling moment, then you play the game again. Um, what we're trying to do with Uncharted is to blur that line a little bit more so that uh, you'll be playing the game along and things start happening around you as you're playing, so you're still interactive. A lot of the ways that we're able to tell the story is through the environment, through the other characters in the scene. Don't you guys usually just cut off a finger or something? Uh, we don't have to cut to a cutscene in order to deliver a line of dialogue or a story or, or things that we want to portray to kind of lead the character on and lead Drake and the, and the player on to the, the bigger story that's unveiling. So all that will happen while you're playing the game. When Drake sailed into the Pacific, he took the Spanish fleet completely by surprise. He captured their ships, he took all their maps, their letters, their journals, and he recorded everything in this diary. Uh -huh. But when he returned to England, Queen Elizabeth confiscated all his charts and logbooks, including this one, and then swore the entire crew to secrecy. Yeah. So See, when Drake discovered something on that voyage, Sully, something so secret and so valuable, they couldn't risk it getting out. All right, Nate, just pretend for a minute that I don't really care about any of that stuff and cut to the chase, would you? A man only interested in the climax. You must be a real hit with the ladies. Never had any complaints. Fine, then I will get to the good part just for you. Oh. Huh? Oh, goddamn Dorado. He was onto something big, all right. Is there anything else from here? Oh, so now you're interested, huh? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, no. The last page was torn out. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, Sully. It's done. This is it. This is finally it. Yeah. Only we got one little problem. Yes, that's what I said. It blew up. It sunk. No, oh, that's why. That's why we have insurance, right? Oh. No, you don't understand, Sully. Oh no, the camera there. The camera's fine. Don't worry about the camera. It's still as good as new. Sully, the girl can hold her own. Uh, you should have seen her. Fine. You go on out there and you tell her, we just found the lost city of gold. Maybe her producer can get it on the air oh, tonight. come on. Nate, do you trust me? More or less? Good. Because we're going to have every half-wit scumbag in the world chasing us to this treasure unless we cut her loose right now. You're real gentlemen, Sully. I know. It stinks. She'll get over it. No, I don't, I don't care that we're over budget. I mean, do you realize that this could be the, the biggest story of the year? <laughs> no, I don't trust him, okay? That's why we need somebody here fast. So just get me a camera crew, and I promise you that... Oh, you son of a bitch. Should have seen that one coming.